What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of All In with Ashley Nicole. And we're going to step away from the basketball and the football, and we're going to enter the world of MMA. And I'm so excited to bring on my guest. I have Juan Archuleta right ahead of his fight, Bellator 246, going down September 12th, the day before his birthday. So that's really exciting. So let's go ahead and bring him in. Juan, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited to have you on. What's up, Ashley? Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. So, I, of course. So, I want to talk to you about the fact that this fight is going down the day before your birthday. How how does that add an extra pressure to give yourself oh, a really good gift, which is going to be a win, obviously? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's always tough fighting before a big day, like uh, your birthday or, like, in my case, you know, it was um, my anniversary, my wife's birthday, and then, and then my birthday all in one. So, it's like all jam-packed in the Virgo season. So it's just like, man, and then you get your fight thrown in on there and you're like, okay, let's do it. So uh, it's a little out of pressure, but it makes the celebration better for after the fight. So let's get into the fight because you joined Bellator in March, 2018. And obviously a lot has happened since then, but focusing on the present, the present is coronavirus. So obviously that shook the world, shook the world of sports. How has your training been different? How have you adjusted to the lack of being able to contact with people in a full contact sport like MMA? Yeah, it's tough because, uh, you know, I actually was supposed to fight July. Um, I was going to be the first fight coming out in July and I actually got COVID and I thought I was doing everything right. Stood, I was like away from everyone, like recovering and, uh, you know, in my own secluded area, my garage, I set up my garage, had mats, like uh, thought I was doing everything right. And then, uh, you know, I don't know where it came from, where, how I got it, but it, it, it set me back and uh, it was difficult. You know, I think it was more like it was such a rush to get down to the weight class that immune, my immune system just got shot. And I must have been like going to the grocery store for a quick second in that time frame or whatever it may have happened. And I got it and it, and I, it was pretty devastating, you know, and it, it made me like realize like I could be as healthy as possible and still catch this, catch this uh, virus. So it made me wake up a little bit and realize that the, the, the coronavirus was real. And, uh, you know, because I was one of those guys that was like, oh, whatever, you know, but I'm still going to stay away because I need to fight and make sure I'm ready to go. But when I yeah. got it, it was like, oh, wow, this is this is real. You know, I got chest pressure. I got into my lungs. And luckily, I found a doctor named uh, Dr. Bennett that helped me out a lot and was able to give me some medication to fight it off and uh, come back just as strong. That's actually a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up because I don't think you're the first person who kind of struggles with that ideology. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, it's not that big of a deal until it happens to them or it happens to somebody that they know. So can you go through your symptoms exactly? How did you know you had it? Were you experiencing any of the symptoms or did you just get randomly tested and boom, positive? No, I actually, uh, so I finished like one of my last strength and conditioning workouts where like I killed, I was on the treadmill running like a five minute mile. I just did a bike, did some like uh, hard, heavy lifting. And then, uh, you know, I was like, okay. And then I came home that night and uh, my coach was telling me like, hey, make sure you keep your, your circle closed because you're coming in on the end of your fight and I don't want you to catch COVID and it like ruined everything we do. And I was like, man, I kind of feel like I have the chills right now. Like I kind of feel like I have a fever. And he's like, really? He's like, oh, man, well, you know, get some rest and let's see how it plays out. And the next morning I woke up and, man, I had like, I felt like I had a stomach bug. I, I woke wow. up and, uh, you know, there's like an old wife's tale like uh, that, uh, you know, my Hispanic um, grandparents and my mom did for me. They would, whenever I felt like I had like a stomach flu, they would rub my calves out. So I told my wife, I said, man, I need you to rub my calves out. I must have ate something bad yesterday because uh, it feels like I want to throw up. And then she's like, all right. So she rubbed my calves out. And then the, the the stomach pain subsided, but I still had little chills. And I was like, oh, man, maybe it's just like, uh, you know, I still feel sick. And then the next day I went and did some blood tests and get it checked out. And, uh, you know, it was still I, I, I had like a really bad headache and still had fever and everything like that. And I was just like, man, OK, this is not going away. Maybe it's something else. And then uh, then I woke up the next morning uh, on Wednesday morning with us. It felt like I had like a strep throat. And I was like, man, this is crazy. Like, 
it has to be COVID. Like, because the blood test came back negative. I was like, I don't believe this blood test. I have something, you know? And then yeah. I was like, all right, let me go get, and my manager kept texting me. He's like, go get the nose swab. I told you, just go get the nose swab. I was like, all right, I'll go get it. So Wednesday I went and got it. And then uh, Thursday it came up and it said positive for COVID. And that day I I started feeling like, um, I don't know, have you ever had like where you want, where you have a cough and you want to hack something up? Like you're like, oh, yeah, 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 it's like phlegm. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I felt that pressure, like when you finally get it up, but I, I had it right there. And I was like, I was like, man, my chest is killing me. And then, um, and, and then the results came back within like 32 hours saying that I had COVID and I was like, oh man, this is, this is devastating, you know? And so I had to do my, you know, I had a dilemma I, either, either I could not tell anyone and just stay quarantined <laughs> or tell yeah. people. And I was like, you know, I feel like I need to tell someone. So, uh, I need to tell the organization cause I fight in a, a week and a half and I, or two weeks and they need to get a new main event. So I told them, I wrote them and said, Hey, listen, uh, I tested positive for COVID. I found a doctor that says he could help me and treat me a little bit. So, uh, I'm going to go do the treatments and see what happens. And then, uh, within two days, I felt a hundred percent better. The, the headaches, the, the chest pressure went away. And, um, you know, I was, I, I felt like I was on the, on the road to recovery. And then within, I, uh, so that was Saturday, Sunday is when I got the treatment. Uh, Monday I went and got tested again. Uh, Tuesday I got the results saying I was still positive. And I did the treatment again that Tuesday on Monday and Tuesday. And then on Tuesday I came back and it said that I was, uh, I was negative. And I was like, wow, that was super fast. He's like, yeah, I told you everything was going to work out. Like now just, you know, finish the seven day treatment. And then, um, you know, and then from there we, we, uh, you know, we'll just keep you on the medication and the antibiotics till after your fight. And I said, okay, let's do it. So since then I've been on the medication and it's been working well. I've been around a couple of people that's had it and kind of helped them out. So, yeah. Seeing how you had such an experience with the testing process, because that has been a concern for a lot of people, especially going into football season. The concern is how accurate are these rapid testing that people are doing and seeing how you got one result and then it ended up being the complete opposite of what that initial result said. How concerned are you going into matches, going into fights against other fighters who can be testing negative for something, but then ultimately have a positive COVID test after future testing or next round of testing, despite the fact that you already had it and they say you can't get it again, but we still don't know. We're learning every day. Is that a concern yeah. for you? Well, um, going into this, I know hundred percent I'm going, I'm going to be fine uh, with this medication because I've been around other people that has had it and, uh, and I didn't experience um, uh, symptoms or uh, getting it again. Um, and I believe it's because of the medication. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, I, I feel for a lot of people, um, and it, it is nerve wracking cause you know, you start reading some of these stories about people dying and like, you know, the symptoms that they're facing that I faced. And it was just like, man, I was that close. And even when this whole pandemic started, my teammate and I, Cub Swanson, were like, man, if we get it, we're in trouble because it's a respiratory problem. And, uh, you know, you could never be the same again. Uh, and the biggest asset that I have is my gas tank. And, um, yeah. so it was nerve wracking, but thankfully I, I wasn't too bad affected by it. So going into these testings and these results, uh, you know, it, it, it can it can happen because my immunity will be down due, due to cutting weight. And it is scary, you know, and we're, we're all, all learning to, uh, about this virus together as it goes on. You know, it's like the H1N1. We're all learning as we go. And the yeah. more we document, the more we're able to uh, let the, the physicians know what's going on with us, the more research they have. Are you adjusting your style of fighting because you did have the virus and it says that you it can, like you said, affect your respiratory system for the long term? Are there any adjustments that you made? Because like you said, your biggest weapon is your gas tank. So how are you adjust making adjustments since having the virus? Yeah, I thought, um, you know, I so I, I even though I, I tested positive within the seven days or negative uh, within seven days, I still stayed in, in my house the 14 day quarantine that was uh, recommended by all physicians. And so, you know, uh, I took the time off and uh, I just let my whole body heal. You know, I was uh, rejuvenating myself with uh, electrolytes, water, uh, uh, amino acids. And then um, 
coming back into it, I was like, all right, let's see how this goes. It's going to take a while to get back in shape. And it was like right away I was feeling 100% and like felt like wow. I could have gone forever. So I, <laughs> I was blessed enough and very fortunate enough to catch it in time where it didn't ruin my lungs. And I do a lot of lung workouts like uh, this um, apparatus that we have that works expanding our lungs. So I'm very fortunate to have a great team behind me to, you know, work a, a, as we learn about this virus, we were able to work around it and add different amino acids to make sure we, we took the virus totally completely out of my bo body. So let's get into your team and, and how that situation is going. So you're 24 and two right now, and that's coming off of a decision victory over Henry Corrales back in January. And yeah. speaking of January, you gave an art, you gave an interview rather to USA Today where you expressed your frustration with the amount of fights that you were getting. And that was January 12th. And probably like two weeks later, maybe two weeks later, the world just stopped. So looking back at that conversation and obviously things out of Bellator's control, out of your control, out of your team's control, how are you kind of working through this quarantine to make sure that when life goes back to normal, if you will, you are getting more fights? Has there been any conversations about that? Yeah, it's just uh, doing more self-promoting. Um, you know, it's uh, taking, um, you know, even though you have a promoter that's supposed to help promote you and, and, um, and, you know, go out there and put you in front of the public. Uh, we have so many fighters on the roster that you know, they have to do the same for those guys. So it's like, okay, like I have to find my own PR people. I have to find great, um, journalists to go out there and put me in front of the media and keep my, my name in conversations and say, is Juan Archuleta the next best thing in MMA? Is Juan Archuleta, uh, uh, capable of beating these guys in different organizations and just keeping uh going back to being self-promotive you know uh there's no better way to do it uh nowadays with the social media we have yeah. you know sometimes we get lost in the training aspect that we have to because it's a it's a it's a full-time job you know and it's a uh, you got to be self-promotive uh you know even though you sign with the promotion and you think okay they're the promoters are going to promote me you still got to do self-promotion and that's the difference between boxing and mma is you know, uh, MMA, a lot of people have to do self-promotion. And I think a lot of people don't know that. I think people see that you're on a fight that's on TV and like, oh, okay, well, that's it. But there's a lot that leads up to that in terms of promoting yourself, getting interviews, things like that. And you were quoted as saying you want to fight five to six times a year. And you even said you want to step further and said since signing with Bellator, it's been the two slowest years of your career. Can you explain, elaborate more on exactly what that means? Yeah, so when I was in uh, King of the Cage, uh, they were able to fight me like five, six, six times a year. You know, I was a four. I was the first MMA fighter to have uh, four different titles and four different weight classes, and uh, you know, and that was because I was able to stay active. Uh, I'm a guy that stays in the gym no matter what. Like even after my fights, I come right back and help my teammates, and because it helps me keep expanding and not stay stagnant. So I'm always ready to fight. You know, I could I could fight once every month, once every. Uh, two months but you know once every four months is a little difficult granted that the 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 price in the purse is different it, it, it's not about the money it's more about you know being competitive being an athlete and wanting to compete you know that's 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 something that you can't do forever uh you know work you could do forever you could work until the day you die but competition yeah. staying young and staying fast and staying smart and keeping brain injury uh from happening um you know staying active uh, that's the best way to do it is uh, staying on a diet, staying eating proper nutrition. It's when you sit yourself back and you're not fight, you're fighting once every three to four months. You know you start eating bad foods. You start um, you know swelling up because you're eating a lot of sodium, or you're just like, well, I don't have nothing to train for, so why train? You know. But if you're able to say, okay, th I got six to five to six more years of training, and I want to get these many fights, like. This is what I want to do. I want to. I want to be the best MMA fighter I could possibly be, um, and, and that's com that comes through fighting. Uh, uh, you know, fight after fight after fight. In my eyes. 
No, of course. And especially like with you for this specific fight, you're dropping a weight class. So how is the process of doing that? Because when you're, you know, there's such thing as muscle memory for people who don't know, and your body is accustomed to training a certain type of weight to maintain a certain type of weight to maintain a certain type of muscle mass. So how does the training differ? How do you change your whole routine? And I think people don't realize this about athletes, regardless of what sport they play, you guys are creatures of habit. So you develop a habit, you develop a routine and you stick to it. And when you're kind of thrown into a loop, you know, with coronavirus or with an injury or whatever the case may be, it throws your whole system out of whack. So when dropping a weight class, how do you overcome and combat that? Yeah. I mean, uh, so with the fight with Henry Corrales, um, I was told I was going to be an alternate, like, Hey, you're fighting Henry Corrales. Cause if, someone were to get hurt you're going to be the alternate and i was like okay and then when the pandemic hit um i was fortunate enough to work out with josh rosen who's a miami boy who's going to be you know hopefully starting for the dolphins this year at Grammy. <laughs> you know uh, listen not if tua has anything to do with it i'm telling you man <laughs> josh rosen and i we put them in a lot of games you know and that was the thing it was like rehab rehab all your because they told me like hey it's going to be a while till you fight and uh i have one of the best strength and conditioning coaches in the world, I believe. And he's so, he his mindset's one of the best mindsets I've, if he doesn't know something, he's gonna go out there and spend the next month researching it and understanding wow. it. Like he understood COVID, he went and got the whole, from the cellular breakdown to, you know, how you eat and everything on, on how to try to defend it. But uh, he got me and Josh, like, I was weighing up to like 185 and I was still dieting to try to make sure I wasn't going to go above 185, you know, and Josh was putting on some good size. And, um, you know, so we were getting ready for that. And then um, I had reached out and I said, hey, you know what? Um, with this pandemic, it seems like a lot of people are going to get rejuvenated, rehealed. Why don't you guys let me fight the first card and let me fight for the 135 title? So again, muscle memory. Uh, my body was used to doing it before. Um, I, I I fought for Bellator, and um, I was like, okay, so it's gonna it's gonna cause different routine, right? So eating different, training different, lifting different, uh, training like a triathlete instead of like a, a muscle man. So um, lost a lot of weight, but was able to keep a lot of strength on, um, which is. Kudos to my coach because he's one of the, like I said, one of the best coaches out there for strength and conditioning and nutrition. Uh, kept me stronger than ever. I mean, uh, we stepped on the scale just this past Sunday. And when I was lifting with Josh, I was weighing about 185 and I had about 138 uh, pounds of muscle uh, on my muscle mass. And then cutting down to 135 now, I'm at exactly at 134 pounds of muscle mass. that I, So I only mm -hmm. lost, you know, four pounds of muscle, which we needed to do anyway in order to come in at 135. And so he, he, he's spot on on targeting and making sure we're gonna be the strongest possible we could be for the weight class. I gotta get back to this Josh Rosen thing for just a few minutes because <laughs> oh, yeah. an MMA guy and an NFL quarterback, what do you got, how did you guys, first of all, even interact with each other, get into contact with each other? And two, is he an MMA fan? What do you guys talk about? How is that relationship forged? Give me the 411. Yeah, so um, I used to coach at St. John Bosco High School, uh, wrestling. And then uh, and I used to work out with a kid named Aaron Pico, who now lives in uh, New Mexico. But uh, Josh was asking about our strength and conditioning coach because he came back to California to do some training. And he's like, yeah, you should get, get together with them. So uh, Coach Cal asked me, he said, hey, uh, do you want to work out with a guy named Josh Rosen? I was like, yeah, he went to Bosco. I was like, I used to live there. And he was like, yeah, yeah, that's what I was asking. I was like, yeah. And I was like, yeah, tell him to come through. I'm down to work out with them through the pandemic. So, um, you know, we started working out. And he happened to be at the uh, Henry Corrales fight when I fought because he was in town. And uh, so he came in and we started lifting together. And then he wanted to do some different things on like, He's like, hey, let me, uh, can you teach me some boxing, some MMA? So we would put the gloves on and like move around. Wow. That's crazy, you know, but uh, <laughs> kudos to him because he wanted to try it out, you know, and then he's like, all right, hey, I need someone to throw the ball to. Do you mind catching it? I was like, yeah, not at all. But man, he was throwing <laughs> that thing and like putting a whole, it felt like trying to catch a shotgun slug, like, bow. I was like, oh, man. Were like, you out there running routes? Yeah, running should we, get you, should we make back... you wide receiver number one for the Dolphins? <laughs> no, heck no. I couldn't <laughs> catch the ball. It was a problem. Like he, he threw so hard that my I would jam my finger. I was like, oh man, like I was like, this guy throws at a different level, you know. And what was well, what was crazy is I used to live across the street from uh Matt Liner, and uh, when we were kids, 
um, it was the same thing. Like Matt would throw it to my older brother, like all the way down the street. And then uh, four, all four of my brothers would be out there. And then we'd have to make a line and throw it back to each other just to get it back to Matt Liner. And then Matt would just chug it again all the way as far as he could. And it was similar with Josh Rosen. I had to catch it and run it to him and be like, here you go. <laughs> I mean, spending the time with him, though, and, and he's had a very interesting journey in the NFL since, you know, obviously leaving college. And you obviously got to see front row and center exactly the type of quarterback that he is. Do you think he's a starting quarterback in the NFL? Yeah, I, I think now he's matured enough where he he's going to be, you know, they give him the opportunity and they give him the chance. If they let him go out there and play, he's going to turn some heads. I think he's matured now to be a leader and he's he's he definitely has the physical capability grown into a man body and uh you know just having the physicality of being able to you know be aware of you know uh all his routes and and making adjustments on the fly i think they give him the opportunity he'll shine for sure because he's been he's been grinding all all off season now it's time to shine for him Listen, you would know. So it's safe to say you're a Rose and not a Tua fan. I, I, I like you going against the grain. I respect that. <laughs> well, he's a Cali <laughs> boy too. So, you know, and uh, not, no disrespect to Tua because I know he's a great quarterback as well. But, you know, I'm just not, you know, SEC or any type of those type of I'm I respect it. Fan, so, yeah. <laughs> so moving on to another sport, some similarities to yours, but completely different. MMA, boxing, the comparisons now. I've interviewed both MMA fighters and boxers, and I've interviewed fans of both sports. And what I find interesting is even boxing fans are kind of heading over to the MMA world because in their words, even in the words of experts, boxing is a thing of the past. Why do you think that is? Um, I think it's just like, uh, I mean, we train with boxers and uh, we understand their art and we get a lot of respect from them uh, when we show up and we do their sport and then uh, they're like, man, it takes a lot of guts to come in here and not try to take us down or, you know, kick someone or like, so, you know, we get throttled by them sometimes and they have the art they, and, and the capabilities there. Um, you know, I think it goes to another thing about being promoting. Uh, it, uh, they're kind of doing old school promotion. They're not on the social media. They're not like the UFC and, and uh, Bellator so much, but uh they, they they just do a great job on marketing. You know, they, they found how to a, adapt and adjust. And, um, you know, it's a new age of uh, marketing. You know, you got to be able to leave the dinosaur behind and jump on the, the new electric cars and be able to ride them and, uh, you know, adjust to it. And uh, I think that's some of the problem is uh, their, their social media game is not strong. Uh, you got a lot of the Ukrainians and Europeans and the Russians. Uh, they're making some good noise. I mean, we train with a lot of them. And they're very talented, and I'd hate to, uh, for it to see it die down. And I hope it comes back uh, and re revives because some of these guys are, that we train with, and uh, you know, Victor Ortiz, and uh, some of these uh, Hispanic guys, you know, they're they're uh, Canelo, Ryan Garcia. I mean, um, you got uh, Fernando Vargas' son coming up. I mean, we train with some of the best guys in the boxing industry, and they're still so talented. And I'd hate to see it die off, you know. And uh, I think. If, if the young generation shows them like a Ryan Garcia, like how to promote it through Instagram or social media, they'll be able to get a revival and, um, you know, be back up there with us. So MMA is essentially the Tesla of the group and boxing would be like, I guess, a Honda, a Ford. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not an electric car. Ford. You know, especially Ford, they, they don't want to invest in doing the electrical cars. So, you know, it's just like you got to you got to adapt. You got to want to do these uh these interviews and do the social media it's pain in the ass i agree but uh you know what's gonna sell <laughs> do you think that we will see i mean conor mcgregor was that was a huge fight when he decided to get into the ring and fight mayweather and i was actually rooting for mcgregor because i wanted him to show that mmi guys can box too do you yeah. think that we'll ever see a crossover like that again i know they're talking about maybe doing a mcgregor mayweather again i don't know if that's gonna happen but do you think that we'll start seeing more crossover events between the two worlds in an effort to once again raise the popularity of boxing and even more so just continue to build on the popularity of MMA? I think we have a, a lot of egos involved um, until we see the younger generation start to take over and set ego aside and say, let's work together instead of working against each other. Uh, that's when we'll see a lot, a, a lot uh, 
more crossover promotion fights. You know, even for us, it's just like, why not do a, uh, uh, that's what's great about boxing. You can have the WBO, WBC, and, you know, and, and, and all these different titles fight each other and all these different promotions fight each other. With MMA, it's only UFC, only Bellator, only one FC. It's like, so in that sense, we're still left behind in that. And then, uh, you know, we're still left behind on being paid too. boxing. They, they, they were in the payday of, of, of what boxing was in the nineties. Uh, you know, we're, we're fighting for world championships and still only making hundreds of thousands of dollars instead of millions of dollars, like the boxing yeah. uh, fighters do, you know? So there, there's still some things that we're left behind in that boxing is uh, light years ahead. But as far as the marketing scheme and like, generating this revenue and like having all eyes on it um you know you can see the night and difference in it is that a frustration of you and other people in your sport that you guys are part of such a popular sport you're part of such a phenomenon and you're just not getting the pay for it you know you look at other sports you look at basketball you look at football you look at baseball even baseball perfect example a sport that's not as popular as it once was my generation's not watching a full baseball game. I don't even, the generation before me is watching a full baseball game. It's probably my grandparents' generation, but they're yeah. still making a ridiculous amount of money, guaranteed money. Is it frustrating, like I said, being in a sport that is so popular, but just not seeing the revenue from it? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, like my boxing coach, Zach Padilla, uh, you know, he had to lay the groundwork for the guys that are making the money. Um, you know, Roger Mayweather, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali, all, all these guys had to lay the brickwork for the guys in the future to get paid millions, you know. And I feel like that's what we're doing right now. We just have to bide our time and hopefully uh, towards the tail end of our career be able to cash in. But, uh, you know, it's very unfortunate. Yeah, it is frustrating to see that, uh, see the promotion get all the money. But, you know, they're the ones doing the work. They're, they're the ones doing the groundwork as well, and they're putting in the time. Um, doing it so you know it, it, it's a catch-22 you know the the you know back in the day Marcus Allen and all those guys they were the ones taking the blows after blows with no concussion testing taking the brain injury and uh, to for these guys to make millions Larry Bird Michael Jordan they're the ones uh, piss fighting literally in, in the games um, you know it didn't matter uh, you know it didn't matter uh, what your politic po political stand was yeah. they were like we're gonna play this game and we're gonna yeah. scrap and we're going to slow down <laughs> and, until someone yeah. wins. So there's no they more. They made you feel those fouls, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah, so those were the people laying the groundwork, and I'm proud to be one of those guys laying the groundwork and hopefully one day be able to be a household name and cash in on my on that. So when I let Twitter know that we were doing this interview today, I got a bunch of questions. And one of the questions that really stuck out to me was you look at the route that Ronda Rousey took, you know, starting in MMA, going into wrestling. So I had a fan question that asked, would you ever consider becoming a wrestler or entering that world? What is your answer? Yeah, you know, my only problem is I'm so humble. I just it looks funny when I talk mess, so I wouldn't be able to put that uh, character in play. You know, I'm, I'm more of the, the, dial the silent but deadly type guy, but, uh, you know, the very Mysterio type feeling, but I would love to. I mean, those guys, are there's no weight class in there, so you go in there and you say, all right, let's 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 have some fun, you know. So I would love to, you know, if it generates revenue and it generates uh, popularity, absolutely. Listen, WWE, you heard it. He's willing yeah. to do it. Yeah. The so I, I know... <laughs> So I know that we talked about your training a little bit earlier on, but there was a post that you posted on August 13th that I need you to explain. So you were doing neurological training and you had this cap on, you looked like Professor Xavier I just, or Magneto. I want you to kind of explain what that is. Is it the first time you've done it? Why were you doing it? Let me, let me know all the details. Yeah, so uh, we actually been doing it for a while. Um, what it's called, it's called the Wavi brain scan. And what it does, it tests the voltages in your brain to see if you have any concussion symptoms, to see wow. how much voltage is in your system, your reaction time, and uh, your physical and your mental reaction time. And so it kind of gives you a baseline. You know, I know some some doctors they do like you know so before we weigh in, we have to like we have to do all these exercises. We have to do a uh, a to z, one to twenty five. Uh, you know, and we have to do it in different orders. Um, and so uh you know 
without doing that and doing a brain scan and listening, uh, you know, uh, our O2 Health Lab is our recovery center that we have. And they're top of the line on treating uh, concussions, like anything with brain function that, uh, you know, us athletes run into, football players, uh, wrestlers, uh, MMA fighters, boxers. You know, it's been – it's I've seen firsthand uh, it pay dividends because, you know, training sometimes you get hit really hard. Uh, training yeah. with TJ Dillashaw, Cub Swanson, Brian Ortega, guys that are number one, number two in the world, um, and me trying to knock on that door and be just as be- just as good as them. You know, it sets up uh, some crazy, some crazy, um, uh, hectic back and forth fights. So, uh, you know, I felt like I got rattled one day, and so we went and did a brain scan, and uh, it just tested a little bit that I was rocked. I didn't have a full on concussion, but there was a little bit of symptoms there, and so we just treated it, and then within. Uh, uh, a week of treatment, I was able to be back at my baseline, which is perfect. Uh, so it just lets us know like when to pull back from training and be smart and not, you know, take concussion after concussion and uh, take more brain injury. So, you know, uh, O2 Health Lab, they do a great job of protecting us athletes. I think that's fascinating. I think that's so necessary, especially in combat sports. You look at, you know, of course, MMA, boxing, football. I think that's so, that could be so instrumental in preventing things like CTE and even yeah. long term, other long term issues that can, you know, come up from getting repeatedly hit and slammed into the ground. So I think that the fact that you take that extra step is so necessary. Why did you start doing it? How did you get introduced to it? Did you just find them? Did they find you or was there another you know fighter or athlete that you were in contact with that said hey you need to check this out no so it was actually uh like going back to saying uh my strength and conditioning coach uh coach cal from the training lab like i said he's one of the best out there he's he's he seeks out the best for us as performers and making sure our recovery is uh and our health is first and foremost um and so he got in touch with this hyperbaric treatment um, center, O2 Health Lab, uh, Mark Westaway. And, um, you know, they they were like, hey, we could really help fighters and people like uh, football players and basketball players, soccer players, just even a- anyone that just gets in a car accident and, and suffers from bad brain injury or like, you know, scuba divers and things like that. So yeah, they're like help with brain function and re- full on recovery. And so we created a gym or uh, uh, coach Cal and myself and a couple other guys, we founded a gym out here called the training lab and uh, O2 came part of it. And uh, now we have our own hyperbaric treatment. We have our own recovery center to make sure on our days off, we're taking full advantage of that and uh, making sure our recovery and our health is uh, first and primary, primary, uh, you know, uh, part of our regimen. No, and I think that's great. Like I said, I think a lot of people forget the recovery portion when it comes to working out or when it's when it comes to training. They focus so much on the bulk up or you know getting stronger and looking better, but the recovery yeah. is such an important part of the body's ability to grow muscles and to heal itself yeah. and to get stronger. So I think that the fact that you're in such a physical sport and you prioritize that is definitely a good lesson for you know fighters who are coming up and fans of the sport like listen yeah we take a beating but it's our responsibility too that it you know is. we got to take care of ourselves and so, it's scary go- too as an athlete like doing those things because we don't want to we don't want to admit we have egos ourselves you know we're kind of nervous yeah. about it too like everyone on instagram is always like you know some things you have to bypass on social media like people saying Oh, you have CTE. Oh, this is a, you know, you're right. We're talking mess to you, but you can't talk mess to us because you have CTE. I'm like, I don't have CTE or I don't have brain problems. You're just talking smack to me. So sometimes it gets nerve wracking. And then when you do get hit, you're like, you're thinking like, man, I hope this doesn't affect me going home, you know, but uh, so doing it is, is nerve wracking. Is that frustrating? I mean, that that's something that, you know, boxers, fighters, athletes in general of, you know, the 90s and the 80s, even the early 2000s did not have to deal with. Your fans were not in such a close range to you, if you will. Is it frustrating, especially when doing a sport where things like CTE and concussions and long-term brain damage are very realistic possibilities that people kind of just freely and just jokingly throw that out there? I mean, at the end of the day, I think people forget that you guys have families to take care of. You have families who want you around for a long time and CTE is not a joke. How does that, how do you deal with those type of interactions? Because it has to be frustrating. Yeah. 
it, it, it's almost like racist, uh, racist remarks towards us. You know, it's just like, come on, man, you wouldn't go out there and call someone, you know, a de derogatory statement, uh, and uh, just because of their color or their um, their sexual background or anything like that. Like, why do that to us? It's it's uh, that's how insulting it feels towards us sometimes. And you know, it, it does play a role on your family because uh, you know they see it and they want to they want to attack back, and you got to tell them like, yeah. mom. Settle down, like you know, my wife Janae, babe, settle down. You know, it's it's just people are cyber bullies. You know, take, just relax. You don't have to you don't have to answer them. Sometimes the best uh, the best the best response is no response. You know, so it it is frustrating. You know, it's derogatory and it does play like psycho psychological uh, trips on you. You know, and I think it's interesting that people are cyber bullies to guys like MMA fighters. Like if I was yeah. gonna bully someone on the internet, it wouldn't be somebody who could like beat me up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe yeah, it would be like a, a governor or like a councilman, but I'm not going to like a war of words with a boxer yeah. or an MMA fighter. That doesn't seem very smart to me, you know? Yeah, and what's crazy too is <laughs> they'll, write an they'll write an instant message to you and they'll be like, hey man, I was just playing. Like, why did you get so serious or have people attack me? Say, I didn't attack you, dude. Those are just my fans. Like, don't yeah. talk mess. Don't even, why are you going to put that and then say, dude, why would you say that about me? Like, or why would you comment back that? That's that's totally disrespectful. Do you have nothing better to do with your time? Say, dude, you attack me. Like, it, it's no, crazy. No, for real. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> it's like, what are you going to do? So I want you to walk, before I get into the theatrics and what you're going to wear come September 12th, I want you to kind of walk me, walk your fans through exactly from the time you wake up to the time you enter, you know, the arena where the fight's going to go down, you're backstage, you're getting ready. What is your ritual? What do you do? Man, so uh, after weigh-ins, you know, uh, that's when the real nerves kick in because you're like, okay. I could eat and I could like recover. And then after you do that, you're with the family, you start hanging out and you start thinking about the fight and you're like, man, this is, this is, this is intense. Like Game everyone's time. here to cheer you on. <laughs> yeah. They, they yeah. want you to win. They say, you got this, you know, you, you trained hard to do this. And you're just like, you're sitting there and you're thinking, you start thinking everything. You think the best possibilities and the worst possibilities. And then, uh, you, it's hard to go to sleep that night, you know? And, uh, so for me, the best thing I try to do is just like think about my outfit. Like, okay, what's some side distractions I could have? Okay, what's going to be my outfit for tomorrow? Like, what can I dress up as? So as I set that up and get everything uh, evolved, evolved into what I want to wear, you know, because my wife helps me. Uh, she does a lot of my shopping for me because um, she knows what I like and uh, she has good taste as well. So she'll she likes to do crazy stuff. Like sometimes it's floral patterns, <laughs> crazy stuff. So, women usually uh, do. <laughs> what's that? I mean, women usually do. It's our thing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah they want to make sure their man <laughs> looks good. Right. So it's like, okay. Uh, I believe in what she said, but we will kind of adjust it as we go and see what I like. So I'll start picking and choosing and I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to wear. And then you wake up the next morning, you eat a little more, and you're like, okay. And you're like, okay, I need to work out and get all this food out of me, all this, uh, you know, sodium, and kind of just get the jitters out. So you go and you start hanging out with your friends pretty much, and you're play fighting, and you think yeah. about the game plan. And then the nerves go away throughout that whole time, and you're like, dude, I'm ready for this fight. Like, nothing's going to stop me. And then you're like, they're like, yeah, that's right. Like, you got this, dude. Like, there's no way that, you know, this guy's going to They're like, all right, cool. <laughs> yeah, and you're like. And then after the workout's over, you start thinking like, damn, man, do I got this? Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, he's probably thinking the same thing. And you're just like, shit. You're like, well, let's go home and just lay down. And, yeah. you know, so I'll there's go nothing, well, There's nothing we can do about it now. So yeah, yeah. we end this we got, Yeah, it's, it's four hours until fight time. So I'm sitting down and, you know, I start, you know, I'll take a little nap and I'll wake back up. And, you know, start, you start getting cold sweats. You start, you start getting sick a little bit. And you're just like. Man, the whole world's watching. Like, there's yeah. nothing there's no going back now. <laughs> like, uh, but this is what I trained for, you know. And uh, I'll put on a little mot motivational um, um, speeches. You know, I'll go on YouTube. You know, Les Brown. I really like listening to Les Brown. He's That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's one of my favorite guys. You know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, I'm a Christian, and and so you know, I I listen to a lot more motivational mm -hmm. speeches through the Bible and, and things like that. So. I'll listen to it and say, okay, and then I'll, I'll pray for a good 30 minutes and just spend time with God and just say, okay, God, like, just let me perform. Like, I don't care about the win or loss. Like, 
you know, I just want to perform. I just want to do my best, uh, you know, uh, glorify you, glorify my family and glorify my last name. Like all I want to be able to do out there is go out and perform and let the rest take care of itself. And if I could do that, you know, everything else is going to play out the way you plan it to be. And then uh, I get dressed and everyone comes over. I'll kiss my wife and tell her I love her, kiss my kids and tell them I love them. And then uh, from then on, you, you turn into a, uh, from then on, everything just turns black, honestly. You into the mode. <laughs> yeah, it's killer, killer mode, and, and uh, from there, everything's just a whirlwind. You wake up the next morning, and you're like, "What happened?" Like you're, you're almost on a super high, and it's uh, your body yeah. takes over. Your muscle memory, like you were talking about, takes over, and uh, you know your uh, your mind just is in a trance, and it's one of the most euphoric and best feelings in the world. Honestly, I wouldn't ever ask for anything else to do. I think that's so cool. You know, people see you and you're an MMA fighter and you're in there and you're scrapping and like you're angry when you, you know, you're in the middle. But before that, you're listening to motivational speeches. I think people would think you'd be listening to like heavy metal or like rock or like, yeah. you know, Rick Ross, something to get you, right. you know, pumped up. But you're back there, you're praying, you're calm, you're, you know, you're serene. And yeah. then it's like you step out there and it's also like the alter ego comes on and you're like, all right, now it's game time. Now I'm going to have yeah. to come get you. And I think that a lot of people don't realize that a lot of athletes are the complete opposite of the persona that you see when they're either in the game or on the field, you know, yeah. in the ring, whatever it may be. It's it's an act. It's a persona, but it's not yeah. who you are twenty four seven. Yeah, it's someone we put our uh, like you said. It's 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 a different person when we're training because we get in that mindset when we're training. Like at first you're hanging out with your friends, and then all of a sudden, like you start getting into a different alter ego, and you're like, "Wow, dude, I'm sorry. Like I hit you that hard. Like <laughs> you're my training day. Like we bust each other up." And I was just like, "Man, I'm sorry, dude." And he's like, "Dude, no, we're gonna be world champs." Like we need this, like, we need this out. So you're just like, okay, like, and you go home and drive in and I'm like, you start thinking like, man, I've really hit Georgie. Like, uh, you know, I feel bad for him or like, you know, but uh, yeah, same thing. You just get in that trans man. And it's just, uh, we're so in tune with our body too. After a weight cut, it's crazy. Like how we know our body, like right now, like my body is so fine tuned and like, you know, the spiritual aspect of praying and like, it just, it comes more alive. It's insane. It's a crazy feeling. I love it. That's amazing. So the fight day outfit, I gotta, I, I gotta ask you because that's probably, you know, for people who aren't actual fans of the sport, that's the best part, you know, seeing what they come in, you know, the theatrics, all that. What goes into your fight day outfit? I know you said your wife has a big say into that, but what is it that you look for? Do you look for something flashy? Do you look for something just simple and elegant, comfortable? What makes an outfit a fight day outfit? So for me, um, I don't like to be plain. I like to, I like to let my clothes be loud because I'm not loud. So I'm gotcha. more quiet and like, uh, like to look good. And like people think like they'll stay away from me more, so I don't have to talk to them if I look flashier. So it's just like okay, like I'm a, I, I want something flashy, looking something that's that sticks out like a sore thumb. You know, like uh, if it's a floral pattern, if it's a bright color, if it's. Uh, you know, something that's just off the wall that people are like, wow, that's, that's, I, I couldn't even imagine if I wore that, what I'd look like, but you know, you're just like, <laughs> you gotta have confidence, you know, like getting towards this date, you know, I'm, I, it takes a lot for me. I'm not blessed with good genetics as far as like, uh, you know, constantly having a six pack or being ripped up. Like my nickname as a kid was Buddha because I used to be a short, fat, pudgy kid, you know, so, and I love Buddha's good luck though. What? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that, right? I love, yeah. yeah rub the belly. <laughs> yeah, I love cookies. I love, you know, brisket, tacos, burritos, you know. Um, so, but it takes a lot. So uh, going in there, I like to wear no shirt under my uh, sports coat. And it's just like, you know, showing off the body and just saying, okay, like this is all the hard work that I put off. I don't get to show show off all the time. So screw it, I'm going to show off. <laughs> I love listen if you got it flaunt it while you have it you know what I mean yeah. that's the saying so yeah, in sure. closing what do you want to tell fans of MMA what do you want to tell your fans specifically leading up to this fight what can they expect obviously they're going to get a win but yeah. what can they expect from you not only in this upcoming fight but in your future and future fights yeah, you know, I just want to let my uh, fans know that I've been working super hard for this. You know, no matter the outcome, I'm going to put my all into it. And uh, I love performing, um, whether if that's going and stepping outside of my game plan 
just to put on a little more performance so my fans could um, could be entertained. Like that's what I want to do. I want to entertain them, and they're gonna see. I'm hoping this fight doesn't end quick. I want it to go 25 minutes so they could see all the hard work, dedication, preparation, the mental ups and downs that I've been through through this fight camp. You know, I've already lost one world title and it sucked and it, it was devastating, you know, and uh, but that wasn't the ultimate goal. You know, my, my, my goal is to be a world champ, but I wasn't able to perform to my capability that night. And every time I go out there, I want to perform for my fans. And that's what they're going to look forward to seeing 25 minutes of performance uh, that they've never seen before. And just a constant offensive action of, uh, you know, it's like, when you're watching the Super Bowl, you want to see a high scoring uh, game. You know, you don't want to see a close game seven to zero. You know, you want to see yeah. back and forth, back and forth. And that's what we're going to see in this fight. Listen, I've had the best time talking to you. And if you're ever in Miami, we got to go see a Dolphins game, whether it's oh, yeah. Tua, Rosen, yeah. Fitzpatrick. Yeah. I mean, they, the options are endless out there, down yeah, there in Miami. So that is for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Josh said he'll hold us some tickets, so uh, I'm going to hold them to it. So we'll go out there. Uh, well, they're not the Redskins no more, but if they, I told them, if you ever play the Redskins, you're at home. You better give me some field tickets because I'm going to be there. But Listen, I'm, I will de- I'm a Cowboys fan, so I will definitely oh, be yeah. rooting for the Dolphins that game. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Definitely so, not rooting for the Washington Football Club. That is for yeah. sure. But I, know, that's I am crazy. I'm still gonna call them the Redskins because I get to because I'm native. I'm Apache by by uh, by blood, so I'm still calling them the Redskins. I'm I'm bummed that they switched their name, but um, really, you know, yeah, yeah. Even, I mean, even, even given your native blood, you 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 didn't have. A, I find that interesting because I ask a lot of people when the name change happens. Um, if they were offended by people who are of Native American blood and they were like, I didn't care. And then some people were like, so offended by it. So you're on the first part. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they did a lot for the Native community. You know, the, the Washington Redskins, they, they, they poured a lot into the, to, to the Natives and uh, gave respect. And so, you know, there, it, it was kind of disrespectful when they changed it. Uh, so, you know, it's just like, man, like that's, pr- that's scenes, scene seeing your mascot or seeing someone being represented in a good way, um, you know, not derogatory. I didn't feel like it was derogatory. And it was just like, man, now what are we going to support? You know, now I don't even want to support the Washington. You can be a Chiefs be. fan. Yeah. Yeah. The Chiefs. Exactly. So, yeah. but they want a Super Bowl. So they're going to be like, you're just jumping bandwagon. But, hey, you know. if you're going to jump a bandwagon, let it be a Super Bowl winning bandwagon. <laughs> that is yeah. for sure. Well, but I, I am st- I am so excited that I had gotten the chance to interview you and I hope the next time I interview you, you're coming off of a win oh, because yeah. I feel like it's, I feel good energy about this. I feel oh, like yeah. good energy about this fight. Coming yeah, up. me too. It's been a good yeah. camp. It's been a solid camp. And uh, I just want to thank you for having me on and all of in all the fans that are listening. Thank you guys for uh, listening to what I have to say. So thank you. Thanks to your audience. And thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity and the platform to get more people involved and understand who I am. Because pretty soon I'm going to be a household name. Ooh, listen, that is, and right there, that right there, that is a good place to end because I like that. That's the type of, that's the type of energy I'm on. Say it again in case they didn't hear you. So just in case you didn't hear, thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to be a household name. And next time you see me, I'm going to have a belt right here talking to all you guys and saying thank you for the support. Listen, I love it. Juan, I thank you. Best of luck. Stay safe. Your family stay safe. That is the most important. And I will talk to you soon. What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for checking out this episode of All In with Ashley Nicole. Make sure you subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any of the new episodes. And while you're at it, check me out on social media and hit that follow because I post some pretty cool things on there that you won't see on YouTube.